It is good to be with you again, and uh, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15, where we have a, <coughs> a portion of Scripture that, again, is uh, instructive to us. It's valuable for our study. May we uh, not just learn it in a head knowledge kind of way, but again, the point of Scripture, the point of preaching and teaching is to equip you for the work of ministry. And so I truly desire that for you, that as I share these thoughts, that as I'm sharing them, that you are thinking of ways in which you can apply that into the life that God leads you forward into week by week. This is not just to become smarter and more knowledgeable about Scripture. We need to apply it as well. And so we come to this passage in John chapter 15. We've looked at a, <coughs> a couple of things already. First being that a couple of weeks ago we saw that Jesus calls us his friend. And that is such a glorious truth. Jesus, the, the God of heaven, calls Dean his friend. I am, I am moved by that. I am touched by that, that intimacy that God bestows upon me. And I'm glad that he said that because another thing that he said right after that was is that uh, you're not of this world and they're going to persecute you. And I go, oh, but you're still my friend? Yes, I'm still your friend. Okay, good. Then I think I'll be able to endure what is coming as they persecute me. And I think what Jesus is doing here on this last day of his life as he is on his way in the middle of the night to the Garden of Gethsemane where, where he will pray He's got his disciples around him. They're making this little crowd down toward the garden. And Jesus is teaching them. And I think what he's doing to them is he's, he's giving them the truth. He's, he's not holding anything back. He, he's, doing what they, he's giving them what they need to hear. And I don't know if you've ever been there as well where you just, someone says, I've got to tell you something. And your response is, give it to me. Give it to me. I mean, okay, it might not, but I need to hear it. So it's tell me what I need to hear. I'm trusting you to tell me what I need to hear. Tell it like it is. Be real with me. That's usually the best policy. And Jesus is going to do that. He has been doing that. He continues on. And, and what we're finding in this passage is that life is not going to be, I don't know if it ever was, but uh, life is not rainbows and butterflies. And I sometimes am, well, I think every time I hear that someone with the word of God in their hands is then says to a group of people, if you come to Jesus, it will be all rainbows and butterflies. It'll just be happy times. Just come to Jesus. I, I am bothered by that because that's not what Jesus said. It's not rainbows and butterflies. He said in our passage just a couple weeks ago, they persecuted me and they will persecute you. <laughs> Why? Why? What did we do? Aren't we nice people? Aren't we good people? Aren't we kind people? Aren't we servant-hearted people? Isn't that who we are? If we are all those things, then why would they take this upon themselves to persecute us? And in the last couple of weeks, we've looked at two reasons. Here they are, just by way of review. It's because, <clears throat> next one please, because we are God's adopted children. He is our Father, and we are not of this world. And be, therefore, we are identified with the hated Jesus. That's our connection that the world identifies to us. And because of this, they're going to persecute us. It's not because so much of our kindness that we do. It's just because we are associated with God himself. We are his kids. Verse 21 of John chapter 15 is where we start today as this, as this dialogue continues forward, as his teaching continues forward. In verse 21, he, Jesus says, but all these things they will do to you on account of my name. Let, we just need to remember that. It's not, it's not you. It's me. It's on account of my name. Now, we have an obligation not to add to the problem, not to do anything that would cause people to have an additional reason to hate us. And we're going to talk about that as we move through this passage. But don't add to it. But what we are to, supposed to do is own it. Own the name of Jesus. And not just the name, but the name and what it symbolizes and who it is and the Lord himself and what he taught and what he communicated. These are the things that we are supposed to, I'm with Jesus. I own that. I wear it. In fact, it's a privilege for us to wear the name of Jesus, and when we have opportunity to make that known, we are to do it. 
There's a way to do it. There's an attitude we should be carrying with it when we do it. But own the name of Jesus. And just understand that there will be times that when you do, you're going to be persecuted for it. It's not going to be rainbows and butterflies at all times. There's a passage from 1 Peter (laughs) that uh, speaks to this. Peter telling his congregation, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You're blessed. Now, there are people who take that, that verse, and with a wrong understanding of Jesus, with a wrong understanding of obedience to him, they do their actions, they make their, the, the cause out there, they present themselves as such, and then they receive persecution for it. And they say, oh, see, see, I'm being persecuted. I was told I would be. There's two different Jesuses that could be presented. The correct Jesus, may we do that, and a false Jesus. And if we're presenting a false Jesus, this is not an excuse that somehow we'll see. It must be true. It must, it must be validation that I'm presenting the true Jesus because I'm being persecuted for it. We need to be very mindful of who Jesus was and what he, who he said he was and follow him as such and be obedient to him in that capacity, not to some other Jesus. We're going to get to that today as well. This other verse from Hebrews, speaking of Moses, Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Moses accepted the reproach. Why? Because he had an eternal perspective. Isn't that what we're called to do, Christians? Do I remind you of that enough, that you're to be living with an eternal perspective, not an earthly perspective? And this is why we are, on account of his name, we may be persecuted. And that brings us to our third reason, all right, as to why do they do this. The third reason is from our passage. They do not know the Father. They do not know the Father. Verse 21 went on and said, because they do not know him who sent me. And we know that to be the Father. Why do they persecute? Because they do not know God. They don't. Now that sounds odd because there are surely a whole lot of religious people on the planet. We've talked about this many times. Every religion, every philosophy makes what are known as truth claims. This is the way of the world. This is how it is spinning. This is what is true. Follow, do this. Everybody has truth claims. However, (laughs) So many of the truth claims come in contradiction with each other. They're in conflict with each other. And truth is stubborn. It can't be two things if they contradict. And we make a truth claim as well as Christians. What I would want to say is what Jesus is saying in this passage. They don't know God. Those who will persecute you, they don't know God. If they knew God, if they knew him who sent me, then they'd be with you but they're not with you because they don't know God. The masses follow false religions. Hmm. Does that hurt you a little bit? The masses follow false religions, and they're following them thinking that they're worshiping accurately. They're they're following God. They use the same word, God. But the masses are following God false religion they don't even know jehovah so how can they worship him if you don't know him you can't worship him lots of activity going on on the planet lots of lists being kept lots of religious energy being expended but sadly it's being expended toward not god not jehovah god they don't know god or the words of jesus God has revealed himself, and man has not properly responded. I I would ask you to turn with me. These are some bold statements I'm making. Would you turn with me to the book of Romans, where Paul does a little treatise, a little explanation, a little mini sermon here as he outlines as to what has gone wrong and what happened that has caused the masses not to follow after God. They don't know him. Why don't they know him? Romans 1 gives us some uh, insight into this. 
We're going to start at verse 18. <clears throat> the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, now notice the improper response. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Verse 25, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. They are not worshiping God because they do not know him. Information was shared with mankind, and mankind did not do what they should have done. They did not thank him, and they did not glorify him. And their hearts became darkened, their minds became perverted, and therefore they are chasing after that which is not true. This is powerful statements from the word of God. What it is telling us is that they, these who do not know God have no personal, reconciled relationship with God. They're doing a lot of things, but it is not reconciling them back to the Father. Mike has just shared that as he prayed for our offering. There's nothing we can do. It is the work of Jesus and the submission to his work through faith <coughs> that saves a man. This hatred is coming upon us. And what is the cause of this? Why do they hate us? Well, I have an answer. Why the hatred? The question is this. Do the adherents of other worldviews, the, the followers of other religions, do they like to be told that they do not know God? Have you ever tried this? Have you ever communicated to someone who, you, they're not a professor in Jesus Christ, as relayed in the scripture, and so you try to communicate the love of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You share that with them. How does that go? Because in so doing, in the very act of presenting and conversing with them, you are communicating, you're, I think, you're in error. You don't know God is a very unsettling thing to say to people. For them to respond with, are, are you telling me I'm wrong? Are you telling me I'm not righteous? Are you telling me I'm not good enough? I'm not religious enough? Is that what you're telling me? How dare you be so judgmental? How dare you tell me these things? You must be very intolerant. You see, this is what's going to cause the persecution. If you jump into the fray and communicate these things, it's going to be difficult. People will say those things about you and to you in your face. Yeah, I don't want to experience that. Uh, I, 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 no, that's uncomfortable. Therefore, I'll just, I won't say anything. This whole idea of telling people that they're wrong is, a, is an unsettling thing in all areas, in a lot of things, right? I, I found it in, in, in many areas. Um, for example, um, when I was coaching baseball, you know, I believe that there is a proper way to hit a baseball, a proper way to swing a bat. Now, you could probably swing a bat 10 different ways, but uh, I think there's a proper way. And there were times when I'm working with these high school young men to say, you know, I think you should try this, put your hands, put your fingers, put your bat, put your this, put your feet, put your hips, all these different things about how to swing the bat and swing the, hit the ball so you have an effective time at the plate. And there would be times where the young men are going, uh, not all of them, but one would go, no. It's like, are you telling me I'm wrong? Now, I didn't use those words, but in instructing them, he's, uh, you're judging me. Are you actually judging me that I don't know how to swing a bat? And I'm going, <laughs> well, yes. 
<laughs> yes. I mean, I don't know how hard this is for you to figure this out. I, again, I'm just thinking these thoughts, right? But have you ever been there? Someone gave you information? Hey, let me give you my opinion on that situation right there. And you're going, well, who asked you? <laughs> I mean, and w w we might be talking about baking a cake, and people get a little, little tweaked out about that, all right? It could be as simple as, you know, you're vacuuming wrong. It's like, stop. I got this, okay? Now, we get bent out of shape on little things like that, how to pick up a ground ball, right? I mean, little things about that. Can you imagine what it's like when you say to someone about their religion, you're wrong? You don't have it figured out. You're in error. I need to make a correction for you. So when they say these things, our answer needs to be yes. Are you telling me I'm wrong? Yes. Yes, I did judge you. Why would you do such a thing? What's our answer? Because I love you. Because I weep over lost souls. Because it's my passion that you come to know the truth. Can we have a dialogue? Can we discuss? Can we engage and see where we might go with this? This is why I would do it. You are in error. And you have created a God after your own liking and your own desires, and you think that that's the true God. It's not. And my word tells me as such. Well, what's with your word? How come you get to have this word? I said, well, and again, that's when you then go into your 10 reasons as to why the Bible is believable above all other sacred texts, all other worldviews, all other philosophies. And I could again ask you, congregation, which are your three favorite of the 10 that you can right now just say to yourself? You have them, right? May I challenge you? May I exhort you? Spend time on our website? Relearn those 10 reasons? that you say, well, here's why I believe the Bible. There's 10 of them. We are the, the most blessed of all people. We have God's word that gives us evidence as to what it says in it is true. So I encourage you to be reminded of that. And yes, that's going to cause us to question somebody else and to tell them that they're wrong because we love them. The challenge is, is that our good news, the good news that we present, it rocks people's world. It, it just really causes them some angst, some trouble, some pain, some confusion. And that's going to result in some people being persecuting toward us. Many will be ambivalent. They will hear it and go, hmm, whatever, <laughs> whatever, go on with yourself. Others will be hateful. Not just ambivalent, but they will take that and they will speak aspersions against you. And they won't talk to you anymore. And they will be, in some cases, on some parts of the planet today, they will persecute to the point of physical pain, possibly even death, because someone dared to present a different truth to them. However, happily, others will be humble. Others will be considering what's being said and go, really? Tell me more. Tell me more about what you're speaking of. And this is the opportunity that we have. So again, <coughs> as I've mentioned these thoughts so far, what is your level of concern right now for those who do not yet know? The not yet believers, are, do you care? We've got our six words that are on the wall over there. We make those into banners during our missions emphasis. But again, the words of weep, weeping, you're, you're torn up about the fact that there are those who do not yet know Christ. Weeping, and, which produces prayer, that produces your proclamation, which produces us to send people and support people, and that others of them will actually go to communicate this in, in regions beyond. But all of us can be involved in those things because they don't know God. They think they know God, but they don't know God. Verse 22 goes on to another challenge that Jesus is just adding on to this. 15 and verse 22, it says, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. That's a weird sentence. Wait a minute. If he hadn't come and spoken to them, they wouldn't be guilty of sin? 
then why'd you come? Because then they wouldn't be guilty of sin. Oh, okay, that's a way to read the passage. It's not the correct way to read the passage, right? If I had not come and spoken these things, to not be guilty of sin is not what it's saying there. What, it, what this is not communicating, because Scripture is clear, right? Without, <laughs> excuse me, it is not saying that people are without sin at all. It's not saying that they have committed no manner of sin. Romans 1 through 3, Paul builds a clear case that people are sinners, There's a specific context that is being spoken of here. What is spoken of here is the specific sin of rejecting Jesus, his words, and him personally, right here and right now. There was a generation who observed Jesus, who heard Jesus, who were engaged with him as he's doing his miraculous signs of presenting himself as the Messiah of the world. And it was that generation that added sin upon sin to their condition because they rejected him. They did not follow after him. And this is the greatest expression of rejecting God. The greatest expression is to reject his son. And they've done it. This generation spoken of here in the first century, they did not accept God's son. This phrase is presented in an absolute form, but it's simply a a method of communication, a communication device, at times a literary device. You make hyperbole statements as well it communicates something and when you say them people go yeah i know you didn't eat the whole i could have eaten everything i mean the whole whatever you're saying about that it's just hyperbole this is a literary device it's a communication technique where god jesus is making clear the powerful sin of rejecting jesus here on the spot they are guilty of this verse 24 says it also The verse 22 was the words that I've spoken. Jesus also couches it in the works that I have done. Notice verse 24 is very similar. If I had not done among among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. So again, the first verse 22 is the words that I've spoken. Verse 24 is the works that I have done among them. They have rejected them. They have rejected God's son here amongst them. It's quite a sin that they have done. And Jesus is using a very strong word, a very strong term to communicate that. He's using the word hate. Look at verse 23. If I, excuse me, whoever hates me, hates my father also. Hates me, hates my father also. And why is this true? We've looked at this throughout the Gospel of John, that Jesus is speaking the words of the Father. Jesus is doing the works that the Father has sent him to do. So if you're rejecting me, I know you're rejecting me, but you are rejecting him who sent me. You're rejecting the Father, and if you therefore hate me, you are also hating God. The rejectors have made their choice. They've made their choice months ago, years ago, in the, in the ministry of Jesus. We saw in the Gospel of John chapter 8, remember this coming out, The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Now, how can someone who says that, who is believing that, say, I love God? I love God. I love God. I just hate Jesus. Jesus is saying, you can't do that. If you hate me, you hate the Father who sent me. There's this connection The title of my sermon is Love God, Hate Jesus. What's the answer to the question? No. No. There's there's no wiggle room in this. There are people in a variety of religions who say, I love God, whatever definition of God it is, but I don't accept Jesus. I I don't follow after Jesus. I'm not his disciple. I, I, I say no to what he claimed to be. Well, then you're saying no to the one true God also. You cannot say you love God and hate Jesus. The rejectors are presenting this through their, their statement about demonic activity involved with Jesus. These two, the Father and the Son, are, are inseparably united. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot love one without loving the other. You can't hate one without hating the other as well. They are the same. And the Jews have professed to love God. Read the dialogues of John as Jesus is engaging with the Pharisees. They absolutely think that they love God. And Jesus is telling the disciples here on his last day, 
It's not true. They don't know God. If they knew him, they would have accepted me the way you have. How much clearer can it be? How can someone worship what he does not know? Who is Jesus? Who is this this son of God that has come forth? He is truly unique. Much of scripture of the New Testament tries to communicate this to us that we won't miss this. To say that I can love God, but I don't have regard for Jesus. Scripture does not allow this to be true. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Notice that the author of Hebrews is trying to communicate a separateness between Jesus and everything else. Think of that as we read these verses. Long ago, verse 1, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Just in that opening paragraph, do you see how it's not possible to say, I love God, but I don't like Jesus. I don't follow him. That, that, he, he was a blasphemer. He was of demonic origin. <laughs> you, you can't do that. Not by that paragraph. It goes on. To which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. This is who Jesus is. He is worthy of worship. The angels are to worship him as well. Of the angels, God says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Jesus is different. Jesus is God himself. There's more there in Hebrews chapter 1, but may I remind you of John chapter 1, our gospel itself. I mean, it's crystal clear. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So to say, I love God, but I don't care for that Jesus person, you, you can't say that and be accurate. Jesus is God. He and the Father are of one. goes on also, this idea, it's not as popular as it once was, but the bracelet, that little christian statement, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Well, he would do what the Father would do. They're, they're the same. They're, they're, they're linked together. No separation here. Now, in our natural condition, and I say that in our not-yet-believer condition, the condition that Scriptures teach we were born in, in a fallen state, in our natural condition... There is a truth that is about it. There's something that's true about us. In Romans chapter 1, I didn't read all of this, but let me pick up a little bit later into verse 30 where it lists uh, some sins, some conditions that are now, that are actually true of those who do not yet know God. And it uses a term in this list, slanderers, and there it is, haters of God. Insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. And there's some things above that and some things after that that just give you this understanding of those who are in their natural condition. This is what's true of them. They are haters of God. That's not fun to say, but it's true. It needs to be said. 
Paul goes on in Romans chapter 8 and verse 7, and just speaking of the mind of these individuals, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. There are people who say, I love God, I love God, and they don't love the true God. They don't love the God as revealed in his holy word. They're religious, granted. They're following God, but not this God. And therefore, they don't know his son. You cannot love God and hate Jesus. Here's a quote that I came across this week. I think it is so true to this passage. Faith produces love. Unbelief produces hate. Unbelief produces hate. Hmm. And, And again, it's not as if they have an excuse to do this. Jesus was so clear, so powerfully communicating who he was in this generation that has rejected him. Verse 24 of chapter 15, he goes on, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, no one else did them, the evidence that I gave, the signs that I have demonstrated, the wonders that I performed, the creative acts that I have done, resurrections that I have done, the messianic miracles that I have done, namely John chapter 9, he opened the eyes of a blind man. When we studied that, from the Old Testament, do you remember? That's a messianic miracle. The one, you will know who the Messiah is because he and he alone will open up the eyes of the blind. And no one had ever done it. And then Jesus did it. It's like, oh, They should have clicked. Whatever their thinking is, whatever their biases are, whatever their belief in what their truth is, that should have humbled and changed and come to a belief in the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. That should have happened. And to some it did. But to many it did not. But Jesus has done these acts. No one can compare to what Jesus has done. There is no parallel prophet that had come or will come. And it's interesting because from the beginning, they, they saw it, they knew it, they just didn't turn their heart to this. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night and he had this comment in his heart, he says it. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. We know that God has sent you. But, but they just couldn't get over their understanding of what truth had to be. They needed to humble themselves. They needed to allow the signs to speak. And they would not. Nicodemus will. Nicodemus is going to come to faith. But this is the challenge that is in front of them. They know it, but they did not follow. And as this continued on, for the for years of the ministry and then the death of jesus and then the ascension of jesus it comes to the first day of the christian church pentecost sunday as we call it the first sermon of of christendom when peter stood up among them having the attention of the crowd he stands up and gives them his sermon in acts chapter 2 and i encourage you to read the whole sermon from beginning to end there's a portion of something that happens when he is done with his sermon something happens and it's, it's this wrenching of peoples from this understanding of what is true. Their worldview has been shaken to the core, and they're allowing it to have an impact in them. In Acts chapter 2, and verse 37, now when they heard this, this sermon, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? I love that concept. Those are changed hearts. They're cut to the heart. Their eyes have been understood. Their spiritual discernment has come. And they realize what they did to the Messiah that they had been looking forward to. They killed him. Oh. And they are cut to the heart. What should we do? Oh, you know, this day, how many souls does it say were added to the church on this day? 3,000. 3,000 people. Ask the proper question. 
What should I do? You're bringing truth to me. My heart sees it for what it is. And I'm willing to take my old truth system and set it aside. And I'm not going to persecute you. And I'm not going to get upset. I'm, not, I'm humbled before you. And I need to now know what must I do. Tell me. Lead me. Guide me. Show me. And as you share the message of Jesus Christ with your co-workers this week, with those you go to school with, with those in your neighborhood, in the clubs that you're a part of, wherever you do life, as you share the gospel of Jesus Christ, some might persecute you, but others might be cut to the heart. And as they are cut to the heart, and they then ask you, tell me more. What must I do? I didn't know this before. That makes sense. There's something in here that's agreeing. My heart is telling me that you're telling me the truth. Tell me more. And you go to the next, and you answer that question. Do you think Peter answered that question? Absolutely. And 3,000 people were added to the body of Christ. This is interesting, this last verse, verse 25. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. Now let me just say, every word written in the law must be fulfilled. If it's identified as a prophecy, it must be fulfilled. And there was something that was written in the Psalms that David experienced. Now, let me just again say, when you read the Psalms, many of them are the Psalms of David, at least half of them are. And David is giving us a, uh, he's living a life that is similar to the life that Jesus will lead and live. He's a type of Christ. He's not Christ. He's a type of Christ. And so when when, um, when David is lamenting and going through the struggles of his life, and he writes out his psalms, you go, Jesus felt that. Jesus said that. Jesus experienced that. It's repetitive through the psalms. And so here's a psalm of David, because it says the law, meaning the Old Testament, must be fulfilled. And it says they hated me without a cause. And he quotes there Psalm 35, 19. Here's Psalm 35, 19. Let not, David is saying this, thousand years before Jesus. Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes wrongfully my foes they have no righteous reason for being my foes i didn't do anything to them they are wrongfully taken up against me and he's just speaking here i I hope they don't rejoice over me i hope they don't get the last word i hope they don't win and so he's he's calling out to god Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes, and let not those wink the eye who hate me without cause. Oh, Lord, don't don't let it happen, David is saying, who hate me without cause. And that's what Jesus is experiencing. They hate me without cause. (laughs) This is an irrational thing to do. It is a blind thing to do nothing in christ could be correctly hated nothing nothing he ever did could correctly accurately logically be hated his character his doctrines his service his acts of of signs and wonders his heart for people none of that could be hated yet they hated him Why? Without cause. As was true of David, it's being fulfilled in Jesus as well. The cause of their hatred is the people's wicked heart. Their heart that will not submit, will not change, will not humble to the truth coming at them. So, do not be surprised by the malice. If you experience some of this without cause, Don't be surprised. I'm telling you, I'm equipping you. This may happen to you as well. I didn't do anything, but remember, you're of God, and you're not of this world, and they're going to hate you because of the message you're sharing without cause. There's evil in this response. Going back to John chapter 3, a couple years ago, (laughs) we said this, we taught this, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Why don't they just say thank you? Why don't they say yes? Why don't they stop persecuting me? Because their works are evil. They're of darkness. They're not yet of the light. 
And this is, this is the condition that we find ourselves in. Now, let me just say, as you go out into the world, into your part of it, and you are an ambassador for Christ, I would encourage you, do not give the haters reasons to hate you. Make sure that you also are without cause. They, they were on me without cause. I encourage you with that. Be proper ambassadors. There's a phrase in the New Testament that it identified, be above reproach. Don't give them reasons to hate you. They still might, but don't give them reasons. There are a couple of verses to encourage you with this. Paul identifies this as well. In 1 Corinthians, he said, what do you wish? He's talking to the Corinthians. Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? Now, that is in the context of he is calling them out for some error that, they, that is true of them. And he's saying to them, do you want me to, when I come, do you want me to bring the rod or do you want me to come with love and the spirit of gentleness? Which would you prefer? And gentleness. <laughs> Everybody that I've ever come, talked with, do you want, as I'm raising my children, do you want the rod or do you want the spirit of gentleness? Spirit of gentleness, please. That's not to say I always gave the spirit of gentleness. What I am saying is we all would rather be, just talk to me nicely. Respect me. Treat me like, an, like, a, like I'm valuable. That's in one context. Here's, the, here's another one, Ephesians 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Above reproach, as you share who you are, what you are, what you believe, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, do it in this manner. Be this type of person. Don't give them a, a reason or a cause to hate you. They might hate you just for the message you're sharing. Don't give them anything else in addition to that. 1 Peter 3.15 also says, In your hearts honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Christian, what is God's will for your life? That when you share yourself, and the truth of the scriptures with others, you do it in this manner. Gentleness and respect. And let me sadly say, I've observed people who are sharing the gospel, and that's not how they're doing it. And I'm going, oh, you don't. Just, just be quiet instead of doing it in the way in which you're doing it. We need to respect people. They might hate us anyway without cause, but we're going to do it in this proper manner. And this is, again, this, this hatred that may come at us without a cause is, another, is the reason, again, why Jesus says, but I'm your friend. How marvelous, how wonderful is this truth that Jesus calls us his friend. And so I leave you with this statement today as you head out into your world. Onward, Christian soldier. Onward. Don't shrink back. Don't hold back but onward into the, into the fight, into the battle that God has for you, to the battle. And I'm hoping that, again, today, well done, good for you. You came to church again, well done. I'm proud of you. And hopefully you've been a little bit more equipped with some knowledge, with some fortitude, with some awareness of what is true in the world and how it's spinning, that you might be a, a greater ambassador for the cause of Christ, that those who do not yet know might come to belief in the Lord of glory. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for this word of God, for the teaching of Jesus as he gave it to his disciples many years ago. I pray that we too would now benefit from it. I pray that you would help us to be the type of people that can go into the world with a heart for them. And as we communicate the truth and present and speak of the errors of false doctrine, I pray that you would help us to do it in a manner that does not bring upon us the shame of men, the hatred of men. It may happen anyway, Father, but may it be without cause. I pray we'd go with these people and give them the boldness and the love to speak your truth to those who do not yet know. And as we do so, we will be giving you the praise and the glory and the honor for great things that you have done. 
And we pray this for the glory of Jesus. Amen. I'll see you next week.